first thing I'd like to know is if you can tell us uh, when you first met Rick Nelson and what did you think of him? Okay, uh, sure. I met Ricky and it was, uh, I was working with a guy named Bob Lumen and uh, we were doing a recording session at Imperial Records in Hollywood. And of course, Lou Chud was the owner and Jimmy Haskell was uh, A&R man. So uh, Jimmy Haskell, we were doing this uh, rehearsal with Bob and I believe it was about the year of 57. And we did the, uh, we were doing a rehearsal on a song and Ricky came into the office and Jimmy Haskell and Lou Chad brought Ricky in and introduced him to us. And uh, he was just a real sweetheart of a guy. And uh, he asked us if he could stay and listen to us play. So he did, he stayed there for about three hours and uh, and finally he, uh, he uh, you know, excused himself and said he uh, really enjoyed the, uh, meeting us and uh, enjoyed the music and would like to uh, to uh, meet with us later, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, the very next day, we had a telegram to uh, come into uh, the studios where his father has uh, the television show. And yep. uh, we went in and did the, uh, to meet his father and had just to, you know, just to talk. And uh, he wanted, wanted us to, to bring our instruments and play live with him. So it worked, uh, it was great. That was, uh, you know, it was a real... Uh, pleasure to meet such a guy uh, you know ricky man. yeah at the I mean, time he had he had been on television and uh, what were your thoughts about all of a sudden uh, now you were working with imperial at the time well i was working with a guy named bob lumen who was recording on imperial records mm -hmm. what was it like to all of a sudden be uh, be playing guitar for a guy who was uh, a television star it was great. I mean, I was I was young. I was uh, well. I was, Rick and I were the same age, mm -hmm. and uh, we were just both having a great time and loved our music. Um, in the early days, uh, there was really, and, and I I have to tell you that I I had a, a real good conversation with Jimmy Haskell earlier, and I, I asked him some of these same questions. But I do want to get it from your reaction too. In the early days, there was no real producer put on the uh, on the label as far as uh, uh, in that capacity and how did you how did you guys go about deciding on the sounds that you wanted uh, on that record how how did those sessions work well it was Ricky and I just you know uh, we would work the songs up and and uh, you know the way that that we liked the you know the basic arrangement mm -hmm. the way it felt good to us and uh, of course Jimmy uh, Jimmy had the uh, uh, the musical knowledge and background, you know, to uh, to work with uh, certain people involved, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on the records. And uh, basically, uh, we just uh, went in and uh, captured that sound that, that Rick and I really felt good about. And, of course, Jimmy was, uh, he was with us on it. I mean, he, uh, what we liked is definitely what Jimmy liked. Yeah. Um, now... I noticed, uh, you know, uh, because I have a collection of uh, of the the stuff from Imperial and then a lot of the stuff from Decca. That right after they moved from Imperial to Decca, you and Jimmy and Rick and and the rest of the people involved with his recordings, right after you moved from Imperial to Decca, there seemed to be kind of a subtle change in the music from a rock and roll rockabilly type to a more middle of the road, easy listening feel. And was this due to to Decca, or do you think that was the era in which rock and roll was becoming a little tamer? Well, I think so. Everything sort of mellowed out at that particular time. And also, Ozzy uh, wanted Ricky to do more ballads type songs, you know, more, he wanted them to uh, do more standards, uh -huh. was and uh, I think it was just an experience of, of you know, being able to, to broaden his uh, music career more so, you know. Was there, um, um, <clears throat> In terms of in terms of the uh, the way that Rick was listened to and such, he's he's really credited a lot with making rock and roll acceptable to parents. You know, in the days of everybody was talking about how evil Elvis was for rocking and rolling and stuff. Um, did you feel that uh, that Rick was uh, especially instrumental in in making it more acceptable to the parents? Well, not really. I think Ricky was just basically. Uh uh, doing the type of music he enjoyed doing, and it just, uh, you know, it just captured that uh, particular feeling and, and uh, that situation. I don't think it was something that was planned. Um, but do you think maybe because he was on television already with his mom and dad and such that it, it was a little more acceptable for him to uh, him to play it? Well, maybe so, yeah. That could be, but 
I don't know. It was just sort of a natural thing. You yeah. Know? Um, now, I know that you worked for years and years with Elvis, and, and you've worked with John Denver. I've got a couple John Denver albums that you have played on, and, uh, and just on and on. Um, how would you rate Rick? And not necessarily in comparison, but having having worked with a lot of big stars, how would you rate Rick in terms of his of his attitude, his work attitude, and, and his work habits? Uh, he was he was great. I mean, he enjoyed every minute of his work, and uh, I mean, he was always looking for something that he could do better mm -hmm. uh, musically or in his acting. I think his acting career was even getting much better in his uh, later years. Did he uh, did he ever talk about his acting and uh, and uh, did he ever express a real desire to do more with it or anything? Well, not really. He was so into his music when I was with him uh, for those few years, and uh, uh, his acting didn't actually come till later. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was more important to him, but uh, in his later years. But I think his music. Just before he died, I think his music career was really fixing to blossom. I think he was really fixing to, to make a real heavy comeback. I want to get into that a little bit, but first there's a there's an era of Rick Nelson that I, that I have admittedly missed. Uh, it was just on a couple of albums, and I'm getting them for the special. I, I've been managed, managed to locate them, and I'm getting them. And that's uh, Bright Lights Country Music and Country Fever. Uh, it was really strange that during that time which was i guess about 66 when when they were doing a lot of psychedelic and uh heavy metal and all the rest that rick nelson an old rock and roll man would all of a sudden come out with very country albums and uh, were you involved in those sessions uh yes i did the uh, the country album the bright lights and country music i did those um what um what do you think prompted that did he talk about his decisions at all to uh, to go country at that time well, he wanted to do a country album, and uh, uh, Jimmy Haskell and I, we, we all talked about it, and we thought it was a great idea. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, when I left Ricky, well, I believe it was about 66, maybe, I did the uh, television show Shindig. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, the reasons, uh, Ricky sort of got, I think he get, sort of fell into a rut of not really knowing which direction to go. And, but you know, it was like, and Jimmy Haskell had one idea, and, uh, of course, Ozzy had another idea. But Ricky was sort of confused about his career at that point, which way he wanted to go with his music. So Ricky and I talked about this, and basically he did not have a producer at that time. So we discussed some things about doing doing a country album. Well, we did the Bright Lights and Country Music, and then I believe there was one other... Uh, country Fever. Country Fever, yes. Uh, after we did those, uh, when I went to work on it, I did the television show uh, Shindy, and that's that's when I had, uh, well, that's when I left Rick. Mm -hmm. And basically, he was in a rut because he didn't didn't know which way to go. And I tried to convince him that what he should do is, you know, at least one more country single to try to go for, you know, to keep that market mm -hmm. for him. And for some reason, uh, he was undecided. But as you know, after I'd left, he went to Madison Square Garden, and he—that's when he did Garden Party. Right. Um, a very mellow country flavor. Yeah, yeah I w I'm particularly really intrigued by all that period uh, because I've read interviews with Rick where he described that that whole period with the country albums and then with the original Stone Canyon Band and. Uh, the intakes and perspective albums as being a real experimental phase for him to uh, kind of try to find that uh, find that niche where he wanted to be. Uh, I'm really intrigued to find out what you as a professional and, and in the music business thought of the effect of uh, Rick Nelson's country years and then moving into the real country rock sound of uh, of his work with the Stone Canyon Band. How do you think that affected uh, the later uh, groups like the Eagles and uh, so many others, Linda Ronstadt, and the whole country rock uh, era that we went through for a while? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, well, I believe when Ricky went in, when he, with the Stone Canyon Band, it was he did go back to, to more of the rockabilly sound. Uh, but I don't think that had any effect on the Eagles or anything. I don't think there was, there was a... Uh, I don't know how you could... Uh, there wasn't a natural tie in there? I don't think so. Uh, no. 
basically Ricky had that sound going for many years, and it's just that he kept progressing. Ricky's problem was was not getting the best material, as always, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started to do some writing on his own. Of course, Ricky and I wrote some songs together as well. Did you did you help him write uh, "Don't Leave Me This Way" from uh, from the early days? You know, I, we did several tunes. I, I, that does ring a bell. Yeah. I'd have to go back through my records, but, uh, you know, we've done several things together, And uh, but I, I was glad to see that he was getting back to writing and uh, trying to create things that he felt good about. Yeah, I have one of his, uh, one of his, el well, I have both of the albums that he recorded with the original Stone Canyon band. One of them is Rudy the Fifth, and he had uh, quite a few things on there that he wrote, and it was just really brilliant work. Um, now, I understand that you have just um, worked with Rick on uh, on on a thing that Jimmy Haskell described as going back to the old sound, uh, uh, a record that uh, that uh, he was kind of involved with uh, when uh, when he was taken from us. Uh, did you work with him during the 80s at all? No, I didn't. As a matter of fact, I had a call from CBS to... Uh, uh, they were reissuing uh, an album that was actually not completed. Mm -hmm. And they had called me and asked me to ask me if I would be a, an advisor and work with them on the album and uh, give them direction as far as uh, uh, musically uh, finishing the album. Mm -hmm. and mixing, remixing the album. But was my schedule got very hectic, and uh, I couldn't uh, couldn't get the time together to do it. Yeah, was that the Memphis Sessions album by any that chance? That was, uh, yes, I believe it was recorded in Memphis. Yeah, um, the... Um you obviously uh, were a very close friend to Rick's. Uh, did you have a sense about where he was headed musically, um, in terms of, not so much in terms of style, but in terms of success, in terms of uh, of his career. Did you have a sense about where he was going? Well, not really, because we sort of lost contact there. Uh, when I went to work with Elvis, uh, of course, I, I did see Ricky off and on and uh, talk to him a few times, but although we didn't spend a lot of time together, I know he was... Uh, uh, he didn't seem to have a lot going for himself, you know, <clears throat> until <clears throat> just recent years, you know, he started uh, with, the, with the Stone Canyon Band. Uh, <clears throat> was really happening. I mean, it was starting to do real good. As a matter of fact, the last show I played with Ricky was live here in Las Vegas at the Sahara Hotel. And mm -hmm. I was with uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Ricky was uh, with his band. So Ricky opened the show, and Jerry Lee closed the show. And uh, that was the, actually the last time that I saw him live. That was a year before he uh, passed away. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It was on like a New Year's Eve night, as a matter of fact, uh, that we were working here a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, over the years, you've seen the, the recording industry changed a lot in terms of not only the technical end of it, but in terms of who was running it, you know, who was actually in charge at the records companies and such. Uh, did Rick ever express feelings about uh, about the way that the recording industry was going? Not really. He was very unhappy with <clears throat> being able to, to find deals and to be able to put together uh, recording deals uh, like he used to in the older days. And then you seem to have to go through a lot of red tape and everything, and uh, they wouldn't offer anything. You know, it was basically, uh, well, <clears throat> go do an album and bring it to us. If we uh, if we like it, we'll talk about it. Yeah. But it's very hard to do business with the people because of such a changeover in the record industry. Yeah, as I understand it, the real problem was that it stopped being so much creative people and got to be a lot of uh, lawyers and, and, and such like that making decisions. Yeah, it's all CB, CB, yeah, CPAs and that type, you know. Yeah. Attorneys running uh, companies. Um, you, of course, worked with Elvis for years and years, um, and I understand that that Rick and Elvis were somewhat friends. Can you can you explain that relationship between them? Well, uh, Ricky knew actually knew Elvis before I did. Really, uh, see, I grew up in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, and uh, you know Elvis started out in Louisiana Hayride. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, a friend just gave me a tape of one of the his very first shows on Louisiana Hayride oh. where Horace Logan is introducing him and, and it's really amazing. But anyway, uh, they were very close and they played football together. They used to uh, get together up at Elvis's house and uh, 
Beverly Hills, and they would uh, play football. But Ricky would take his team up there, and uh, Elvis would have his team. Well, Elvis had some pretty big boys on his team, so uh, <laughs> one time Ricky showed up with the Rams. <laughs> so no. that was that was quite a game. <laughs> that must have been. Uh, how did Elvis view Rick uh, professionally? I mean, what did he think of his records and his uh, his uh, his songs and such? He. Uh, from what he'd always told me that he really he always liked Rick. He always liked, uh, uh, you know, he he really liked Rick's personality and uh, his you know his laid back way of, of singing a song and uh, the way he would present his songs and everything. And uh, he really enjoyed the uh, watching the TV show. He thought Rick uh, had a, had a great acting uh, ability. Um. I'm going to ask you just a, just a, a couple personal uh, uh, viewpoint. You know your personal viewpoint on, on Rick personally. Uh, first of all, there's there's always the temptation to think that nobody can be like Rick Nelson was on that television show. Nobody can be that nice and that and that polite and everything. What was Rick like personally? Well, believe me, he was that nice. He was one of the sweetest guys that I, I believe I've ever worked with, and real sincere person just a real honest person and i tell you he was he he was a great talent i tell you it's a great loss to the industry i tell you yeah. really in my personal opinion he was one of the one of the finest people that i've ever uh, came in contact with uh, musically personally or whatever just unbelievable yeah how was he as a how was he as a friend i mean was that was he a real loyal friend and such? Yes, he was. i tell you what, I could pick up the phone and call him and he'd be right there any time. Um, did, you, did you ever, in the, because you knew him in those very early years when you were both teenagers, um, was there ever any time in his life when he was, when he was a little taken with his own stardom and, uh, and, uh, or how did he actually view this incredible stardom that he had? Well, I don't, first off, I don't think he realized how big he was in the music industry and another thing uh he was he was like a little kid in the candy store you know when he'd go in and do a uh, record a good song and and uh he would sing a great vocal and 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 you know and all the music and everything would just knock him out he was like a little kid i mean he just he just uh that's all he talked about did you guys play live uh, a lot in the uh, in the early days in the in the late 50s early oh, 60s yeah we worked Atlantic city we used to do eight shows a day and what, city still here. what was right, uh, Rick like in with the fans? Oh, he was he was great. I mean, he'd just go out and really just perform. I mean, just really put on a good show, you know. And even as quiet as he is, he even he got once in a while he'd get loose on stage. <laughs> and he, you know, he tried not. He was a little nervous about talking to the people. As long as he's singing his song, he's okay. But. He he got real nervous when he would have to talk, you know. Okay, um, I want to just shoot you a quick theory and get your comments on it. I, uh, while putting together this special, I've come closer and closer to Rick, and what he was about. And I have the theory that Rick Nelson was probably one of the biggest stars who was the least concerned about image and about gold records and about awards but he seemed to be the core of his being seemed to be that he wanted to play music and that was it uh what do you feel about that yeah i, I really feel that he did he just wanted to to do music he wanted to do good and he wanted everyone to appreciate him for what he was you know not for what he could be or who he wasn't you know did he get real frustrated when when uh, the Beatles kind of wiped everybody out and his records sold no, less? No, not really. No, he didn't. Uh, no, he. Uh, as a matter of fact, he really admired the Beatles uh, so much. He talked about them an awful lot, and uh, he he loved their. As a matter of fact, he loved their work so much that he started, uh, you know, doing some of their songs and even uh, comping their arrangements. By the way, uh, just as an incidental note, I had read an, read a, an interview that he did back in '81 that uh, said he was talking to George Harrison, and George Harrison told him that he used to George used to listen to Rick's records and try to copy James Burton's guitar playing. Had you ever heard that? Uh, yes, I did hear that. As a matter of fact, I was in England just about uh, three, four weeks ago, and uh, I was out at George Harrison's house. And George and I had a very great conversation about Ricky and how much he admired Ricky and those early records and, and uh, Hello Mary Lou. 
flipped him out. <laughs> That's wonderful. I, n I never realized that, you know, everybody always says that the Beatles were so influenced by Elvis that they never mentioned Rick in there. Oh, no. Um, do you feel that, that the music industry or at least the... Uh, the, the promotional and the, and the publicity end of, of the music industry sort of sold Rick short uh, in terms of his contribution? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so, really. Uh, I think it, it goes in circles, you know. Everybody has to, to make decisions, you know, and follow through with them. But I don't think so. I think, I think if Ricky, like if he was here today, I think he would... Uh, he would actually be uh, probably doing something even greater than, than what, what he has done, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Carl Perkins told me in an interview the other day that he felt that since Rick had had the spotlight on him even you know before he ever started recording is is just the from the time he was born he was obviously uh, the son of Ozzy and Harriet and and in the spotlight and he told me that he felt that anybody who had the spotlight on him like that had to be better than just good they had to be excellent um, would you consider Rick Nelson to be an excellent uh, musician and singer uh, yes, I would. I really would. Uh, Ricky, Ricky always had the uh, the energy that that it took to to sit down and put put a song and put it together the way he felt, and uh, he would not let up until it, he reached that uh, that that situation. You know. My understanding, is he also had a lot of input into uh, into the sound of his records. Yes. By all means, he did. Yeah. Uh, James, the, the final question that I'm asking uh, everybody that I'm interviewing, and that's a, that's a whole lot of nice people, by the way, is uh, from your personal perspective, you know, having known Rick and been his friend for all these years and, and worked with him and taking into account that all of the time that you spent with him and such, from your personal perspective, how would you like the world to remember Rick Nelson? Well, I, I would like the world to remember Ricky Nelson as being one of the, the nicest persons on earth and uh, not only a great entertainer and a, and a great singer and a great actor. Uh, I think the guy has such, you know, his background in music from his father and his family. Uh, I would like to, to say that he, he was just one of the greatest uh, people that I'd ever worked with, and, and I'd like to see people, uh, I would like to, for people to remember him as that kind of person. That's not great. What, not what the, the news media uh, presents, you know. I would like to see them leave it as such a, a great uh, family man, you know, and just he was just a wonderful entertainer and a great person and just a great friend to me. Okay, let me let me tag in one question because you brought up something. How was, uh, what did he, uh, this is kind of a dumb question if I ask you what did he feel about his family, but uh, what kind of family man was Rick? Uh, he, was, he was a great family man. He loved, he loved his, uh, his kids and, uh, of course, his mother and father and uh, his brother David. They were very close. And uh, his family, uh, <clears throat> even in the last two years that, that Rick and I were together, uh, his wife, Chris, they were really close, and uh, after I left, I sort of got out of contact with uh, with their personal family situation. But I know that that the last time I had talked to Ricky, that he was just real. He was so proud of his kids, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know his two boys and, and Tracy, of course. And uh, yeah. I mean, he just he loved his family, and they were they were really close. I don't know if that had any effect on his uh, later situations you know but uh... sure um i would like to tell you just just for your benefit that uh, one of the things that we are addressing and you kind of alluded to it a moment ago was uh the the media hype of uh possible connection to drugs being used on that plane and that being the cause of the crash we are making a statement in this special that that was absolutely untrue that it had nothing to do with it, and uh, making our attempt 
to clear up any any misunderstandings about that because as a as a fan like i said uh, uh a fan for uh 25 years at the time of his uh, death uh I was personally very hurt and angered that they would even insinuate that and then wouldn't go to the same trouble to clear his name when it was found out that it, it, it had had nothing to do with it. So uh, I did want to let you know that. And thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, John. Man, uh, this is really great. You know, I just wanted to say about this, this drug thing with Ricky. Uh, of all my years of working with Ricky, I've never known him to do any drugs in any way. And okay. I was really shocked when I heard that myself. Uh, uh, I mean, I was beside myself. I couldn't believe it. We're going to make sure that that gets cleared up because I I was really hurt by that, and uh, I knew it wasn't true. I met Rick once, and, uh, you know, he was just a wonderful human being, and I want to make sure that his memory lives out in the right ways and for yeah. the right reason. Well, see, I'm sure I'm sure if that came up, you know, and, and the, the report that they had found uh, in autopsy or something, I... I mean, it's really a shock to me because I've never known Rick to do anything. And, uh, I mean, believe me, I mean, I've uh, put my soul on that. I mean, that's unbelievable. Well, I thank you a lot for, for talking with me, and I will try to uh, to get back to you a little later, and it'll just be for a couple minutes. I don't want to keep you too long. No problem, John. Thanks, James. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.